street when out the corner of my eye I saw a pretty little thing approaching me She said, I never seen a man who looks so all alone Or could you use a little company? But if you pay the right price, your evening will be nice And you can go and send me on my way I said, you're such a sweet young thing, why you do this to yourself? She looked at me and this is what she said Oh, there ain't no rest for the wicked Money don't grow on trees All right. I hope you guys are do <clears throat> are doing well. It is Sunday, May the 21st, 2023, and I'm Jules Thought and welcome to my channel. And today we are not talking about the big five stories in the true crime genre. We're going to talk about another Mormon murder. Now, I'm not picking on the Mormons. Don't get me wrong here, okay? I, I think they're perfectly wonderful people. But I'm curious about the number of domestic murders that are coming out of this community. It's a little worrisome, right? So, to, what I want to talk about today is um, Eric Richens and his wife, Corey Darden. So Eric and Corey were married in 2013. So when Eric died, which was March of 2022, they were really only just a few months short of making their 10 year anniversary, right? Now, Eric's death was a strange, one the the process but you know how for a couple of years you know i've talked about you know don't stay people these uh these domestic violence situations that end up in death there's there's this common thread of staying and staying and staying in, in spite of the fact that there's very real evidence that something bad is going on and so for eric that was his situation. He began to discover that something bad was going on and he continued to try to keep it going. He continued, he was invested in the family, he was invested in his children, and I guess, well, there have been uh, family spokespeople who have said that, you know, he, what, he did love her and then she started doing these really, really um, bizarre and over-the-top aggressive acts. And, and he, he stayed too long. And I, I sometimes think that, that I should do, a, I should do a st a, just a um, playlist of, you know, you stayed too long. At some point, you have to go, this is violent and this is um, unusual and... I may be sleeping with the enemy. So, Eric was born on May the 13th, 1982, and he was born in Davis County, Utah. His parents were Linda and Jean Richens, and he was the oldest of the siblings. Um, he had two sisters. His mom passed away in 2018, but thankfully she was able to have a uh, Corey Richen sign a prenuptial agreement, which, which was a good mom paying attention and having a feeling about things may not be what they appear. Um, her family, you can't make this up. You, you honestly can't. Her family, I'm talking about Eric's mother, Linda, her family was from Kauai, Hawaii. And when she died in March 2018, she was actually in Hawaii in, at her family home. So, so it's, it's so uncomfortable, isn't it? It's so uncomfortable, these parallels between these Mormon murders and how they all seem to have these 
connections. It it is very it's very strange. I I wouldn't have been surprised, you know, if they had said, okay, well, Linda when she died was in Missouri, because according to LDS, that's where the Garden of Eden is, right? But Kauai, why do we keep having all these? connections to Kauai in these kind of crazy deaths as well as cult stuff you know the the lady that died in California and her cult leaders kept her in the bed and painted her eyes open and all that um remember she they were in Kauai for a while the ladies of light the cult that we found on YouTube Kauai Lori Vallow Kauai. And Kauai's not that big of a place, y'all. So, it, you know, are, is there something in the water there? Or is there, is there something metaphysical and mystical that's in, you know, invading these people's lo logical, rational minds? I don't know, but it's kind of chilling. So family members, you know, Eric's history was that he was actually really devoted to his family. Um, he grew up, they had a cattle farm, and he did all of the, you know, tending to the farm, including mending fences, hauling hay. Uh, Eric, when he was in high school, uh, he played basketball, baseball, and soccer. He was, he was a well-rounded, you know, natural athlete. And then um, he ended up meeting Corey. They were together for 12 years but they got married, the 10-year the anniversary of the marriage would have been this year, 2023, in June, 2023. Um, they did have three children and they lived on a small mountain in Park City, Utah. So to say that they were living their best life, you know, would be an understatement. They had a really great life. Um, we do know that Eric did missionary work. There are references to him and Temple, and but when you actually read the actual articles about him, they leave out the whole religious information. And I get it. I, I do. This LDS religion, they don't want they don't want these negative um that these big mainstream crime stories they don't want that reflecting on the religion right you you know that you know that's true they did not want to own Lori Vallow they didn't want to own what was happening with Chad Daybell and his family they didn't they didn't want that they don't want to own the dentist here in Texas that killed his wife to go and be with you know his Mormon lover in Colorado so so the truth is, is that Eric was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. His missionary work was in Mexico City. And he and his really, uh, I guess, his best friend throughout his life, Cody Wright, um, they formed a business together. And it was, a, it was like a construction business. They did masonry work. And it was really successful. And... They were doing very well financially. Well, they were doing very well financially until he married Corey. And then Corey began to, I think, embezzle money and destroy money. And it, do, it does look like she was amassing the money for herself and maybe was planning on a getaway. So... Um, Eric was ultimately poisoned March the 4th, 2022, um, when Corey gave him a lethal dose of fentanyl. In fact, she gave him so much fentanyl that it was five times what medical professionals would say would be a lethal dose. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. These results do come from a toxicology report. And yes, Eric, unlike Timmy Daybell, Eric um, Richens did have an autopsy. So he, when I say that he could be part of this playlist of they stayed too long, 
you have to understand that these poisonings with Corey started before the day that he died. It happened on multiple occasions and it happened to a point that he actually says to his friend, I think she's poisoning me. On February the 14th of 2023, she leaves a sandwich on his truck at work with a love note. Well, it's Valentine's Day after all, right? So he's like, wow, that's so nice. My wife brought me a sandwich. And he eats the sandwich. And shortly after eating the sandwich, he's got hives and he cannot breathe. So he does have an EpiPen. He takes the, you know, he, he administers the EpiPen and then um, ends up falling asleep and sleeps much of the afternoon. And it was at that point then that he comes forward to some friends and he goes, something is not right. This is something strange is happening here. Now, Corey was working as a cashier when she met Eric and they were very much in love. They, they, she was tickled to death. She was so excited to get his attention and then they began dating and, and it was a very good thing. They ended up getting married June the 15th and that was in 2013. And it was very interesting because there was no word said about the family finances. He comes from a fairly wealthy um, family with multiple business interests. And he, she is waiting with her bridesmaids to, to do the wedding. And the mother-in-law, future mother-in-law, comes into the room and says, Hey guys, hey, you know, I need to talk to my sweet daughter-in-law. Would y'all leave us for a moment of privacy, please? And of course, they all leave happily. And she whips out a prenuptial agreement. And the prenuptial agreement says, hey, guess what? You do not have any rights. You, listen up, Corey. You have zero rights to any present or future income, property, or assets. I mean, this was a hard line prenup. It didn't leave anything to the imagination. So neither Corey nor Eric would have had any type of right to present or future income, property, or assets unless Eric Richens dies before Corey and at the time of his death, they are lawfully married, living as husband and wife. In that case, then Eric's partnership interest in the family business and resources would transfer in equal power directly to Corey Richens. This is from the court document. So, you know, it's sad because, because you know that the mom felt uncomfortable about Corey, right? She felt something felt wrong to her. Now, we don't know, I, what I don't know, I don't know if Corey is LDS. I don't know if she, I, I can't find that. But something made the mom uncomfortable and apparently didn't go through her husband, Eric, because she sort of got, got Corey into a position of, are you really marrying for love? Or are you after our family fortune? So what's it going to be? You're going to just marry, going to walk down the aisle, marry him because you love him, the man. In that case, you should have no problem signing this prenup, which is all inclusive. Or are you going to back out and say, this isn't fair. I'm not going to start my life with these limitations. Go get Eric. I need to talk to him. And she did none of that. Actually, she just signed right away. She just, and you don't know if she did that. Cause she was in shock and she didn't know how to 
weasel out of it or how to manage it. She was a fairly young girl, you know. I mean, she wasn't very sophisticated. And so she signed. Now, sadly, I'm sure that the mother-in-law didn't realize that she was putting her son in, in, in dangerous way. She was trying to protect her son and his interest. But again, she had no idea how unstable Corey really was, or apparently was. She didn't know that there were people out in the world that would be willing to kill for money. She didn't, she didn't recognize that. And so, it, you know, it's, it's sad. It's a, it's a tragic tale. Um, when you hear about all the things that Corey did to... Um, to basically take the money and the finances from Eric and put it un, into her own use, it, it's fairly shocking. She, at the time that Eric died, she was actually in debt, and, and this was in debt in a legal fashion, where Eric had, had gone to the court with proof and receipts of the money that she had embezzled and or stolen from him as well as the business that he owned with Cody Wright and said, this is what she's done. This is stealing, this is embezzlement, this is fraud. And the court had said, oh yeah, absolutely. You owe him, pay him back more than $500,000. This woman had basically stolen more than $500,000 from her own husband. It's crazy. So, this all started in September 2020, so that had several years of good marriage. But in September 2020, um, Eric realized that there was a 200, or had been, a $250,000 home equity line of credit on his Utah home. Now, he thought, what in the hell is this about? Like, why, why, is, why do I have a $250,000 credit on the equity in my house? I, don't, I didn't take that loan out. Well, come to find out that Corey Richens, his wife, is the one who got the $250,000 cash that was based on this line of credit, right, from the equity of the home, and she spent it. Now, we don't really get a good breakdown of what she spent it on, but we do know that she was buying houses, fixing them up, and then reselling them. So what we call flipping houses, right? And so one would think, well, maybe she's flipping houses. Then she sells the house at a profit. Now she's laundered that $250,000 as it's, my, it's actually a rightful income from the sale of this house. So that, it, that may have been part of what the gig, right? So $250,000 and it's gone. It's all been spent. In addition to the $250,000 line of credit, um, she had actually gone into his bank account and had withdrawn $100,000 without his knowledge. She just took it. He didn't know. It, it was supposed to be there. He didn't know it was there. She also had run up more than $30,000 on his credit cards. She had been given the, uh, she was helping with the company business and it, she was supposed to be um, paying the taxes. So when it all came to a head and Eric contacted the family advisor or the uh, tax, not the tax advisor, the financial advisor and business associates, um, they uncovered that not only had she stolen this $100,000 and the $250,000 and the $30,000 in credit cards opened up in Eric's name without his knowledge, that she had also stolen $135,000 that was earmarked money for quarterly payments on his business. $135,000. So she, she, um, she builds up over $500,000 that she's outright stolen. This all begins unfolding, like I said, in September of 2020. 
Well, I don't know about you, but... <coughs> <coughs> That would have been the time to leave, right? That would have been the time to say, this isn't working. But he stayed. And the family say he stayed because of the boys. And he loved her. And he you know, wanted to make it okay. So then, December. They're still working out all this legal stuff going on related to the business, you know, whatnot. And, and then in December, Eric hires a, a divorce attorney and an estate planning lawyer. So he's hiring a divorce attorney in 2020 without Corey knowing Eric finds out from the lawyers that she has changed his will. She has been purchasing. This is crazy a story. I can't even imagine that starting in 2015, so five years before he begins to see the writing on the wall, only two years after marriage, two years after getting married, this is when it starts, right? So was the mother-in-law right? <laughs> Were her feelings justified? Absolutely. She signs the prenup in 2013, and in 2015, Corey begins secretly purchasing life insurance policies on Eric Richen's life. Between 2015 and 2017, Corey has fraudulently purchased four life insurance policies that totaled approximately $2 million in benefits. These policies were not disclosed to Eric, nor to Eric's estate planning attorney. So she's already on this. Two years after the wedding, she's planning this. In my, in my opinion, she's planning it. So fast, so she, so she gets this life insurance money that's going to make her a millionaire. Then she kind of goes into, you know, uh, um, down low mode. She's doing nothing. She's sitting back quietly. She's sort of waiting, right? Now, in addition to the four life insurance policies that it total $2 million from 2015-2017, there is also a $500,000 life insurance policy that is a legit policy coming from his uh, business, right? This is the life insurance policy that Eric himself has taken out and it, it, he changes the beneficiary after all this comes to the, after the lawyers find out what she's been doing behind the scenes since 2015, it all begins coming out. And so he goes to the divorce attorney and the estate planner and they begin trying to protect his business interest and his his children's um inheritance and so they they take the 500 000, well they establish a living trust first of all which is they make a business entity and the business entity is under the control of his sister kate benson okay so now it's so similar to lori vallow the, the story of Lori and, and Charles. So Eric makes his sister, Kate, the beneficiary or the executor of the living trust. And it is called the Eric Richens Living Trust. It happened in 2020. He also takes his $500,000 life insurance policy that he thinks is the only one that's out there. He doesn't know that he's been insured for $2 million. I want to know something. Is Corey Richens friends with Lori Vallow? Does Corey Richens know Melanie Gibb? Come on, you super sleuths. Let's find out. Exactly how close is Eric Richens property to, um, to uh, David Warwick's property? Is there any chance at all 
at all that Eric and David Warwick knew one another? Because this is freaky. This is so similar, it, it's kind of chilling. So Eric's walking around, he's got $2 million of life insurance on his head, in addition to the legitimate policy of $500,000. The $500,000 policy, uh, they are now taking that policy and they're changing the beneficiary from uh, Corey um, Richens they're changing it and making the beneficiary the Eric Richens Living Trust. So if something happens to Eric, that $500,000 goes into the Living Trust, which is also his money and other assets and whatnot. It all goes into the Living Trust, and if anything happens to him, then the Living Trust is protected and it's there to take care of his three children. Make sense? So, so he's taking plant. Now, it, Corey didn't know that Eric changed his will. She didn't know about the living trust. And she damn sure didn't know that his sister, Kate Benson, had become the executor. So... In January of 2022, Corey applies for another $100,000 life insurance policy on Eric Richards. It was issued on February the 4th, which was only a month before he died. But hold on, because remember the story on February the 14th, she, that was the first time that she poisoned him. He got the sandwich and the love note. He ate the sandwich. He became very drowsy, broke out in hives, couldn't breathe. He administered the EpiPen, and then he fell asleep for hours and hours. And when he woke up, that's when he began telling people close to him, I think she poisoned me. I think she's trying to kill me. So February the 4th, there was a new $100,000 life insurance policy, the fifth policy that she's taken out illegally. Only 10 days before the first time she tries to kill him, but ultimately finishes the deed one month after purchasing that. Now, um, so... I believe, if I remember correctly, I believe the February the 14th, um, I can't remember if that was the hydrocodone or if that was the first round of fentanyl. She tried to poison him with hydrocodone, and that wasn't enough. Then she bought fentanyl. It still wasn't strong enough. And so then she went to her supplier and said, I want like the strongest fentanyl you can possibly get. She got that on March the 1st, and it was administered to him on March the 4th. So, so there was, there were, much, she was intent on this guy dying. Like, she was all in. She was 100% all in. Now, they know all of this related to the various drugs and when, when she tried to kill him because they have an informant the people that were actually buying the drugs for her, the drug supplier, and there were two levels that she went through, they're talking. They figured out who they were, they got them, and now they're talking. So uh, the infor her, her acquaintance, it, and that's another thing you don't understand. Why would she be going through an acquaintance for something like fentanyl wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be wanting to look for somebody that you like super duper trusted? Why would it just be somebody kind of, I don't know. It, and maybe, you know, does the, does the drug dealer know Chad Daybell? There's a question. Sleuths? So CL stated that, um, Corey asked, uh, the, the acquaintance is being identified as CL. And CL says that Corey requested fentanyl. 
So she messaged one of her friends and said, I need a, I need a drug dealer. Imagine that. I want you to imagine just contacting one of your friends and say, hey, babe, what's shaking? Got any idea where I could get a little fentanyl? I can't even. I can't. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, so, so she messages this supposed person and that person knows a drug dealer. The drug dealer is in Draper, Utah, works at a Maverick gas station. And so on February the 11th, um, she gets 15, uh, somewhere between 15 and 30 fentanyl pills, um, that were, that were pretty good quality. And so the, the listen how involved this was. The, the acquaintance goes to the drug dealer, buys the fentanyl. And then the acquaintance goes to a random house that the acquaintance did not know that the house was connected in any way to Corey and left them on, this, uh, in the, uh, on the driveway of this abandoned house. And it turns out the house was owned by Corey. It was one of her flip houses. So while she thinks she's smart, she's not. She's a dumbass. So at this three days later from the fentanyl being left in the driveway, Corey leaves the sandwich with the love note. And that's when he has trouble breathing and he gets sick and he administers the epi, which probably did save his life because it would have increased blood pressure and heart rate. Um, and, and so then at that point, um, in addition to all of the money that she had embezzled and stolen from uh, her husband, Eric, then it came to pass that Eric finds out, he already is now thinking, is she trying to kill me? And now he learns, because he's got all these lawyers that are working on this problem, and he learns that Corey has outstanding state and federal taxes of $189,000. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. In addition, she went to a hard money lender, not a bank, a hard money lender, which is big uh, interest rates, right? She goes to a hard money lender and she borrows $1,850,000 to buy another flip house. And Eric told family and friends, he was dead set against this house. He didn't want it, it the cost of it was way outside of their living, you know, their ability to be responsible for that kind of money, way outside of it. So this chick has built up Basically, uh, legally owing Eric Richens $514,000. She has back taxes of $189,000. And then she owes hard money lenders $1.9 million. Just wrap your brain around that. This girl hadn't got a pot to pee in. And she is in it for two and a half big ones. It's crazy. Two and a half million dollars. And she doesn't have anything. No education. She has nothing. No, no um, sustaining business. And she gets, she uses his name and gets in bed with these hard money lenders without the ability to pay them back and is embezzled cash from his business to say that this ma this lady made a mess of things, that, that is the biggest understatement I've ever heard. And then we find out that because the February the 14th Valentine's Day sandwich wasn't strong enough, she demanded stronger pills. And CL said, that's going to really cost you. And so she paid $900 cash for a handful of pills. Sounds like they were pure fentanyl in my book. 
same surreptitious type of handoff between the money being left at the fire pit. The CL shows up with the killer pills, takes his money, leaves the pills. And then a week later, six days later, on March the 4th, Eric Richens is dead. And listen to this. She calls 911 and she says, you know, I, I went out, I did this, I did that. And when I came back in, I got in bed and I noticed my husband's body was cold. Right? That's 911 call. It, it, it's cold. 911 arrives and guess where his body is? <gasps> it's on the floor. Like Tammy Daybell. Like Tammy Daybell. It's on the floor. But her story was I came, I got in bed, and when I got in bed I could feel how cold my husband was. So here we have yet again another Mormon spouse capable of walking and moving around once they are deceased. It's a miracle. On March the 6th, two days after her husband's dead, Richens calls for a locksmith. The locksmith came and drilled in to Eric's safe that was at the house. And inside the safe was somewhere between $125,000 and $165,000 in cash. Now, Katie Richens, the sister, she shows up. She shows up and goes, oh, no, you don't be. That is not your money. Oh, yeah. And this is not your house. Oh, yeah. And did you know that you are not the beneficiary to the life insurance policy? And did you know that they already uncovered all of your fraudulent life insurance policies? And so they are no good. Ha! Huh. What do you got to say about that, Corey? And at that point, Corey punches Katie in the head. True story. So deputies show up, of course. Deputies show up. They call the Eric Richards estate planning lawyer. And the lawyer comes out and says, yeah, Carrie, you ain't got a pot to piss in, girl. Move on. Collect your shoes and your one suitcase and head on down the road. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. So, on March the 9th at 10.24 a.m., the phone record showed that CL had contacted the acquaintance and had asked her to drive to Draper and that she was driving to Corey's house in Francis where she wrote another $1,300 check for more fentanyl. The check from Corey Richens was dated March the 6th. So the, the uh, evidence that has been collected that is hard and fast against Corey is that CL got the pills, which, which she was told was fentanyl, made the switch off at Corey's house, and there is a now a check with Corey's name on it. She's screwed. She's screwed. So, so it's a crazy story. And, you know, please, those of you that have been, you know, in our community for a long time, you know that I'm not making fun and think this is a funny story. I'm, I'm showing this, this girl was nuts. She was crazy. And she, she killed a man that was so devoted to her that even once he uncovers all the fraud in 2020, he stays with her for three more years. Well, um, two and a half years. Trying to work it out. And the whole time he's trying to work it out, she is sitting back like a spider. Waiting to get him. 
waiting, waiting to kill. It's crazy, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. Heartbreaking tale, heartbreaking. And in the meantime, you got three little kids who have lost their mom and their dad. Terrible, 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 terrible tale. All right. So that is the story of Eric Richens, a man, a very good man, who lived a very good and decent life, and it was all destroyed because he stayed too long. Who else stayed too long? Suzanne Morphew stayed too long. Right? 